Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to wait just a few minutes as people are, are piling in now uh, for the seminar. <coughs> All right, I think we'll get started. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm really excited to have everyone join this webinar. Uh, my name is David Uminski. I'm the Executive Director of the Data Institute at the University of San Francisco. And if you are here today, I believe you're here for the Whammery Lightning Talks. Uh, so give you just a moment uh, for you to uh, go click on a different link if you meant to go somewhere else. Um, but next slide, thank you, Andrew. So just briefly on the Data Institute, on the left is the mission of the Institute. Uh, it really uh, is built upon these pillars here of getting out of academia and partnering outside of both um, USF and finding other partners doing research such as WAMRI, as well as our industry partnerships that uh, we've been sort of working with for the last eight years. Uh, our goal in the end is to train highly talented and ethically trained data scientists. That's both through our master's program, our bachelor's program, as well as our continuing education. Today, though, this is about supporting data science research, uh, and we'll, we'll be able to hear a lot about that today. Um, but in doing so, we're also building an inclusive community of data scientists. Uh, for us, you know, being at the very beginning of uh, academic data science training, you know, we feel that we have the opportunity to impact a field, both who works in that field and who's, who feels included in that field from the very beginning, and that's very important to us. Um, and I think very much aligned with this initiative that we're gonna hear about today is also, you know, finding data science solutions to social issues, which medicine being one of them, more, now more than ever. Um, our other two, we have three research initiatives at the Institute. Uh, the top one is our youngest Center for Applied Data Ethics, which is chaired by Rachel Thomas, and, you know, is, was founded in August of this past year. Uh, and we're, there we're working quite, quite a bit on trying to understand the immediate harms of the misuse of data. Um, I just had the pleasure of um, co-presenting with our data scientist, Daniel Grisenda, on the middle impact to the board of the 11th hour, which included Wendy Schmidt, and all the work we're doing um, using data science uh, to help solve environmental and social problems. But today, which I'm delighted that we're spending uh, at least an hour on, is a review of the work this past year in the Wicklow AI and Medical Research Initiative. Andrew? So I want to first start by, by uh, thanking the Wicklow uh, Foundation, which is, uh, you know, run or founded by uh, Dan Tierney, uh, and who's supported this initiative for the last couple years, uh, as well as um, Fred, who is, I think, on this call and will be, will be noted in some of the work, for, for really you know, seeing the vision of what we thought we could do at USF uh, and, and, and the work that could get done here. So the way I wanna explain Whamry just briefly is I believe it's a new paradigm in the way one can do interdisciplinary research in the area of medicine. Um, it's efficient, it's highly scalable and deployable. And some of these numbers really reflect that. USF, as many of you on this call know, actually does not have a medical uh, in, you know, program itself. We do not have a medical school. Um, our goal is really to build teams of interdisciplinary researchers with a lot of the data science and machine learning coming from the University of San Francisco side and finding research partners that have incredible data that can have high impact, uh, you know, we could solve high impact medical problems uh, in collaboration with. And in year one, we had three research institutions. There was an end of the year presentation around this time last year. 
And since that, the call for new proposals, we've really grown significantly to uh, engaging with eight research institutions in year two. Um, the number of our practicum projects has really grown, uh, doubling there as well. And overall, the number of people engaged on our side in this initiative has really grown significantly as well. Um, not the only measurement of success for, an in, for a research initiative uh, such as this one. Uh, we have a holistic approach to what success looks like for each research project. But of course, one academic standard is, is uh, peer review publications. And for that, uh, I'm very proud to say that over the last couple of years, uh, we've had some really highly well received and um, high impact works that have been accepted for publication at the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, BMC, medical physics, and more, you know, many of the areas that you'd expect um, work done at the intersection of uh, artificial intelligence and medicine would really look like. Um, Andrew, next slide. Uh, I, I, always, I always like pictures of people except myself, but I really feel this is a way to see a lot, many of the collaborators on the USF site uh, found here are also on this call, have contributed greatly uh, to the projects that are done. Uh, and in a few minutes, we'll be hearing from a couple of them. Laura is the only graduate, so she's finished her postdoctoral fellowship and has since moved on, but is a really important uh, contributor to the, the work done here. Next slide, Andrew. Uh, you know, when, when I tried, when we sat down as a team to list out everyone we were working with in the past year or so, we came up with what I still believe is an incomplete list of both uh, people and uh, institutions, but I really want to make sure uh, to really sort of present the depth and, and, and breadth of, of, you know, our partners on this research initiative. Uh, Ross Felice, who's at MedStar, uh, which is Georgetown's medical school, uh, has been a great and brand new partner. Uh, Gore is, our very, is a very, very new partner with us this year. Uh, and that is, uh, you know, one of our first explorations with uh, private uh, partnership as well on research. Um, Claudio, I've had the pleasure of working directly uh, with our, the team at Harvard on microscopy, and I think we're going to hear a lot about that uh, work um, from one of our postdocs today. Um, one, of my, one of my favorite earliest uh, projects that came in in the second round is this work that's really coming focused on pediatric cystic fibrosis, but has since uh, expanded to many areas, and uh, delighted that Angie can talk about that work with her. Um, Salk is a returning partner and one of uh, just a really uh, high-end research group working there led by Yuri Manor and uh, just some incredible work. Fred Monroe, who is the person I mentioned earlier, who's also at Wicklow, has been a big contributor on that side as well and a huge supporter of, of, of Whammery in general. UCSF has been our long-term partner and as you can imagine has you know, many, many, many uh, names and collaborators associated to this and I welcome all of our UCSF faculty here. And you know, our newest partner this year, which we've had a really great you know, public kickoff with the AIMI initiative with Matt is uh, with the Stanford group. And we'll, we'll see some of the work there as well. Um, and and you know, lastly, you know, to round out the Bay Area research groups we're working with is UC Davis, which has been a really great collaboration that includes uh, one of our undergraduate data science faculty members as well, um, Daniel O'Connor. So this is, you know, for me, this is, um, this is really, a, you know, in in a, in a positive way, overwhelming. What what I thought we could maybe get done uh, as an initiative coming out of USF. Um, what I think is even more exciting is what the impact it has had on our on our graduate students, and our postdocs, and our partners. Today, we're going to look at a lot of uh, just a subset of these projects. I'd say a lightning a set of lightning talks around them. And for me, I, you know, I'm it's hard to keep getting surprised at how good the work is every year. And that's in no small part to Andrew Shaw's leadership, who's the director of research for Whamry and will be speaking um, soon. And I really wanna thank him now, and I'm gonna to have to thank him many, many more times as well um, for his work to lead this entire work. He has had a very important uh, fingerprint on every one of the, the projects that, are, that you'll see today and many of the others that we've posted as well afterwards. Um, Andrew, I think that is this my last slide, I believe. Yep. Mm -hmm. So what I want to say then next is, you know, without further ado, though, I'd really like to introduce Jeremy Howard, who's the chairman and you know, founder of, of, of both Fast AI and Whamory. Uh, it's been a delight to work alongside. And he's going to.
I think David lost connection. Um, but yeah, Jeremy, <laughs> would you like to go ahead? All right. Without proper introduction. <laughs> um, thanks for the half introduction, David. I'm hopefully we got the good bit of it. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm Jeremy Howard. I'm the um, chair of uh, Whamry. And I, I just want to say a huge thank you to Dan Tierney and, uh, and Wicklow for um, making this happen. Uh, we're, we're so, so lucky to have that support. Um, USF and the Data Institute has been doing some great medical research uh, and AI work, particularly with uh, our partners at UCSF for a few years. But it was really thanks to the um, um, the help from Wicklow that we were able to take it to the next level. And, and now we have, as David showed, so many um, amazing projects going on. Um, uh, as David mentioned, WAMRI isn't just about AI and medical research. It's also about applying data science in an ethical way. And sometimes data science uh, is a lot less sexy than deep learning. And uh, my focus over the last few months has been what is in many ways some of the least sexy work I've ever done, um, but it's a really important part of what Mamory's been doing, which is to work on public health. And specifically, I've been working on the science of mask wearing um, uh, for COVID-19. Um, this came about actually because of uh, something which wasn't directly connected to WAMRI, which was uh, actually a Data Institute deep learning course that I was teaching and uh, teaching a unit about um, compiling evidence and using different types of evidence to make data-driven decisions. And I needed a case study. Um, and so I decided to pick a case study of public mask wearing as being something that might be kind of interesting and relevant. Um, I had no previous experience of this uh, myself. Um, but in doing the research for that case study uh, for my students, I was shocked to discover that the evidence for mask wearing was incredibly strong and, um, and that the impact of it could be incredibly high. So I, I taught this, um, this lesson and um, my students, so I guess there was about a thousand students in the, in the lesson, uh, kind of nearly unanimously said, you should make that lesson available publicly straight away um, because it's actually more important um, than just as a data science case study. So I did, and um, I couldn't believe what happened. Um, we, we talk a lot at the Data Institute and at WAMRI about the importance of following up, you know, on, on your data science analysis with actual actions. And um, it was really interesting to see what happened when we made um, our analysis of the data around mask wearing publicly available through this video, it kind of took off. Uh, the Washington Post contacted me and asked me to write an article about it. Um, and uh, that article became one of their most popular articles. Um, and then after that article came out, I got asked to make this case on Good Morning America and Nightline and on Fox and the Ingram Angle and CNNBC, MSNBC, Joy Reid on CNN. Um, you know, all this stuff started happening and it suddenly became clear I <laughs> was now kind of not just a data scientist, but a, an advocate. Um, but we did need to do more science um, as we started talking to policy groups like the CDC, uh, various senators that I was talking to, US senators, um, uh, saying, you know, we need to make masks a US policy, uh, getting push, got pushed back about this, the quality of the science. So um, as David mentioned, at WAMRI, we try to take advantage of a multidisciplinary approach. And so what I did was I put together a team of 19 scientists um, covering uh, nearly every continent, covering sociology, um, biological mathematical modeling, epidemiology, biostatistics, um, a whole wide range of, of areas. And um, we compiled the first ever evidence review of mask wearing in public, um, ha so had uh, 106 references. Um, it's still winding its way through the review process at the Proceedings of the National Academies of Science, but we put it on a preprint server called preprints.org. And again, kind of surprised me what happened. It turned out to be the um, most popular paper ever 
um, published on preprints.org. It's had over 100,000 views. And so then that took on another life of its own. The Royal Society commissioned a review group on this uh, topic that heavily leveraged um, our paper. Um, it's been cited in the Lancet, it's been cited in the British Medical Journal. Um, and, you know, it's, it's not complex data science. It's really just um, a, a simple analysis of, of, of the simplest possible data that's really out there. But um, no one had just compiled it all together into one place before. And so eventually we were successful in getting the CDC to change their guidelines. Um, and I was kind of on the phone to government folks, you know, in every jurisdiction. This, this morning I was on the phone to the main radio station in Ireland, uh, regularly talking to the mayor of London, um, talking to various senators. And eventually what we did was we actually um, organized, me and a guy called Vincent Rajkumar from the Mayo Clinic organized a letter um, which we had co-signed by over 100 scientists, including two Nobel laureates, um, the, uh, uh, the editor-in-chief of uh, The Lancet, um, the editor-in-chief of Nature, uh, Bob Wachter, who's the um, head of the medical department at UCSF, and various other folks calling on world leaders to implement uh, a, policy, a policy of requiring masks in public. Um, and so then that letter, letter took on a life of its own. It uh, got published widely, including in one of India's largest um, um, newspapers and uh, uh, was covered in USA Today and uh, lots of different places. And, and eventually, finally, we got the WHO to change their guidelines, which just happened two or three days ago. Uh, so it's been a super long kind of project into, I mean, short by in some way WAMRI standards, it's only been three months so far, but long in terms of public health standards, um, that it really took months of convincing um, that it was really a combination of, of data science and advocacy and communication. So I think it's a, it, it, you know, even though it didn't really have the AI angle, it's a very interesting fit with, um, you know, WAMRI's goals and approaches, very cross-disciplinary uh, and very public focused. So, um, it's not over yet by any means. Still only 16 states in the US have required masks. Um, but believe it or not, we're now at the point where 95% of the world's population lives in regions that require or recommend masks. So if you look at, compare that to three months ago when we started this campaign, that number was basically zero. Um, so it's been an extraordinary change. Um, anyway, anybody who's interested in that, I will paste in a link to a one and a half hour podcast that just came out, which tells his story. Um, so you're welcome to check it out if you're interested. Um, yeah, so that's been my focus. And now obviously with me being um, focusing on that so much, um, it hasn't left me time to uh, <laughs> help out uh, our students very much. And so really the rest of the stuff you're gonna hear today is thanks to the amazing work of the students and faculty, and particularly the person I want to introduce now, which is our um, director of research, Andrew Shaw. Um, Andrew is um, an absolutely extraordinary individual. Um, uh, like me, uh, doesn't have a formal background really in, in, in medicine or AI. Uh, we're both kind of self-taught. Well, you know, Andrew's partly self-taught and partly taught by fast.ai, which is an excellent uh, course I highly recommend. <laughs> um, and uh, we've been so, so privileged to have Andrew working with us. He has um, uh, done an ex extraordinary job of, of um, really helping build this, uh, this uh, initiative and making an extraordinary success of these projects. So when you see the projects today, you know, um, uh, a lot of them have Andrew's fingerprints on, on them, as well as the fantastic work from our um, academic medical partners, institute partners, and the fantastic students and faculty that have worked on them. Uh, so, um, Andrew, hand it over to you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. And first of all, I want to say, yeah, I, I joined WAMRI last year. And the moment J Jeremy asked me about this opportunity, I basically picked up everything and and left, and then I, I'm here with uh, Whammy today. And being able to, uh, for this past year, um, being able to see all the students and the hard work they've done, um, as you guys will see uh, on their presentations, um, it, it's been very impressive. And 
Also, another thing is to one really want to thank the collaborators and our a lot of these projects, as David mentioned, is we rely on the domain experts um, to to help us with the problem. Uh, and another thing I want to briefly mention was just the format of this. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to have four minute lightning talks or four to five minute lightning talks. And afterwards, we're going to have about a minute Q&A. And for you guys uh, in the bottom right tab, you should be able to see a Q&A uh, panel and you can type in your questions. And David is going to be the moderator for this and he'll ask our presenters directly. Yeah, I'm back. Sorry about the tech oh, yeah. difficulties. All right, Andrew, go ahead. Okay, good. Um, yeah. I'll go ahead first. Let me. All right. Um, so the research I want to present today uh, is on cytospin analysis for lung disease, and this is a collaboration with David, who you just saw, uh, Sarada Lee from Perth ML, and Dr. Luke Garrett from Telephone Kids. So what is cytospin analysis? Uh, it's essentially a way to look at what's going on inside a patient's lungs. Uh, first, you take the mucus from their lungs, uh, you put it through a centrifuge and onto a slide. And when you look at it through a microscope, you'll see something that looks like this. And the reason we do that is by looking at what's present, uh, you can tell a lot about what inflammation there is. Uh, we specifically care about five types of immune cells and uh, by counting and classifying the populations of each, you can get a good idea on the lung disease type and the progression. For instance, if you see a high population of neutrophils, that is more of a characteristic of cystic fibrosis. Uh, similarly, a high population of eosinophils is more associated with asthma. The current methodology for doing this analysis it involves manual cell counting by trained immunologists. Also, this process is often not digitalized and we couldn't find any public data sets available. And the question we had was, can we streamline this process? So as we mentioned earlier, there weren't any public data sets available. So the first step we did was build our own labeled data set. And to do this, we took two things into consideration. The first thing was that labeling should be efficient. And uh, if you know immunologists, they have much better things to do than labeling images. So we want to make it as easy as possible. Uh, counting accuracy was also important as well. And currently the two best systems for doing so is object, object detection with bounding boxes and pixelized instance segmentation. But uh, both these systems have their own problems. So for object detection, uh, you get low model accuracy, particularly when cells are clustered together. Uh, though the annotation part is relatively easy as you just uh, need to label a bounding box. For instance segmentation, uh, accuracy is pretty high, but pixel by pixel labeling is very, very time in intensive. What we discovered was there is an easier method and this is center point detection. Uh, this is actually a solution really specific to our cell problem, and that's because you'll see these cells are very circular and all very uniform in size. So that makes it relatively easy for a pathology pathologist to find the center point label, and also makes it easier for our models too, which becomes simpler and accurate. Uh, to give a concrete comparison, we took a benchmark data set on Kaggle, and we found that the center point detection was more than 2x better than the error rate of bounding boxes. Here's some examples. Uh, so for object detection, you'll see that when the cells are far apart, uh, the predictions actually do pretty well. But when the cells are close and clustered together, uh, things start to get a little bit messy. For center points, uh, it actually handles these clusters pretty well, as you'll see. Uh, it's very often that center points don't overlap, so um, it's pretty easy to separate them out. For our data set, we also care about multi-class, which means different types of immune cells. And you'll see the different colors here, they represent the different types of immune cells. 
Uh, here's an example where it doesn't do as well. Uh, you'll see that when the cell is pretty large, sometimes it annotates multiple center points. But for us, uh, this it's actually okay with us. Um, and we were really focused on iteratively building a larger data set uh, in the most efficient way possible. And so we built an automated pipeline, which first predicts on new data. Then we propagate those predictions back to our annotation tool. Uh, then we have the immunologist correct our mistakes, and then we retrain and repeat. And what this does is having a human in the loop, it helps us uh, build a larger data set instead of unnecessary doing all the labeling first. In summary, uh, using center points, it really simplified the whole process and also uh, produced more accurate results. Uh, also doing, uh, doing the iterative approach, it helped save time uh, and labeling effort as well, uh, especially for immunologists. Uh, as a result, uh, we plan to release this really unique labeled data set. Probably uh, there hasn't been anything like it. And we also hope our models will significantly streamline the set has been analysis. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, and so j just one brief question as we transition to the next uh, speaker, you know, given the level of accuracy on this labeled data set, um, what are the sort of next uh, pieces you'd like to work on uh, in terms of that side of spin analysis with this tool? I see. Yeah. Um, so after the point annotations, I actually have a slide later on. Um, we've, we've also built a tool to, we eventually want to do segmentation. And by looking at segmentation, you can actually see the cell morphology by, if you look at the cell walls, uh, for someone who is more sick, the cell walls actually start to deteriorate. So that's very important. Um, and we are working on tools to actually auto segment these, um, these cells uh, to, to help in that process. Perfect. So those would be the next steps. Thanks, Andrew. Oh, and one brief question that just popped up. How many images are in the data set now that you'd like to release? The data set we have right now is 400 images. Uh, that's the one we have annotated. And we were looking to build 20x, 20x that. Yeah. Great. All right. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. So next up I have here um, is Al, Al Latif and Annette Lynn, who's been working in partnership with, uh, with the SOLVE team. And the title of their talk is uh, Decrapifying Microscopic Images of the Brain. And I'm glad I was, I had to say that out loud. So uh, I'm gonna let Andrew start, start off the presentation and then we'll go to the Q&A after that. Hi everyone. This marks the end of our warming journey this year and here we present our work. Our focus is decrapifying microscopy images of the brain. Electron microscopy is a powerful tool to map the structure of the brain. Like all imaging tools in biology, EM suffers from the so-called eternal triangle of compromise, which means that within the microscopy system, there is no way to enhance the resolution without sacrificing imaging speed and sample damage. So we train deep learning models for a solution. Our models are able to generate two nanometer resolution images from eight nanometer source. Our main objective, known as a decapifier, is the deep learning model that decapifies EM images and enhances them to a higher resolution. As is shown here, the decapifier restores details to the image as compared to the low resolution input. However, as you can see, here the generated image differs from the ground truth in texture. It looks blurry and surreal. That's our main focus in this project. Let's make a team. We are Al and Annette. Annette is on the top right of the screen talking and Al will show up in a minute. We are master students here at the University of San Francisco. The project we work on is a collaboration of the Data Institute at USF and the Salk Institute for Biological Studies. We gratefully appreciate the seamless support from Dr. Roy Manor and Ling Jing Fang from Salk, and Fred Monroe and Andrew Shaw from Warmery. At the heart of our work is this guy called feature loss. While mean squared error compares the prediction and ground truth pixel by pixel, feature loss compares their features. To implement the feature loss, we need to train another deep learning model to be an expert of features. Because it will be criticizing the decapifier, we call it a critic. 
As you can see, if the features of the input into the critic vary a lot, the critic will capture this. The critic compares the features of the prediction generated by the declarifier and the ground truth and measures the difference, which is in turn called feature loss. Because the critic knows features well, in our context, it knows biological structure as well. We hope that the critic will provide the declarifier with more information about biology instead of only pixels. We now arrive at the core of this project. We want to study and find good critics for our EM decrepifiers. The critics can be trained on different tasks, which impacts the performance of the decrepifier. From here, I will hand it over to my teammate, Al. Hi, everyone. My name is Al, and in the next few slides, I'm going to briefly talk about the main methods and overall results that we got. Now, as Annette mentioned earlier, in order for us to use feature loss, we first need a critic model. We use three main methods to train our critics. The first method, known as self-critic, um, generally involves training a critic on the decrapification task itself using basic MSE, and then using that to train our new decrapification model using feature loss, hence the name self-critic. In our second method, we used in-painting, which is a self-supervised learning technique where the critic is trained on images that have random patches removed, and the, the critic is trying to fill in those patches. In our last method, we used a different self-supervised learning technique known as contrastive learning, where the critic is trained to try to maximize the agreement between augmented versions of the same image, whilst maximizing the disagreement between augmented versions of different images. To evaluate each of our models, we use the PSNR and SSIM scores as our metrics, but we also use human subjective evaluation by looking at the visual predictions of each of our models. In terms of the metrics, the self-critic performed the best by giving us the highest PSNR and SSIM scores on the real world test set. However, in terms of the visual predictions, the story was less clear. We noticed that the baseline model and the self-critic appear to show visual predictions that, that are very similar to each other. However, when we compare the baseline model with the models that were trained using self-supervised learning, such as contrastive learning, um, the self-supervised learning critics appear to produce visual predictions that have much better structural detail. Next, we wanted to find out which specific self-supervised learning model worked best. And so we, looked, we took a closer look at a different test set on their predictions. On the left is the, is the predictions from the contrastive learning model, and on the right are the predictions from the in-painting. One common theme we noticed from these comparisons is that the in-painting model does a better job at adding structural details in its visual prediction than the contrastive learning model. In this final comparison, you can see how the in-painting model um, is, does a better job at detecting individual vesicles than the um, CLR model. To summarize our findings, we showed that using feature loss can lead to better performance than regular MSE loss when we train our critic on domain-specific data. We also showed that self-critic is simple to implement and generates the best results in terms of metrics. And finally, we showed that the in-painting critic generates the best results in terms of texture and structural detail. Thank you for taking the time to listen to, listen to our project, and please feel free to ask us anything. Thanks, team. Uh, so let me look to see if there's any questions here on um, from the Q&A. And I also have one comment, and maybe someone could ask it either in the chat or in the questions. Um, were, did anyone uh, struggle to see the, the presentation on this go around? Um, so I'm going to put that out there. But uh, for this team, Alanette, so again, uh, similar question. You know, in terms of, you know, if you had six more months instead of one more month, where, you know, which direction would you take some of this work in? Um, yeah, sure. So um, if we had a little bit more time, I think we, we were very interested in finding out how, how all of these methods compare um, at different levels of, of labeled data. So, so far we've been using all over the labeled data that we have, but um, how do these methods compare when we use, let's say, 5% of the labeled data or 10% or 50% to give a, a good um, representation of how each of those methods are, perform based on how much labeled data the user has. Um, it's definitely something that I was that we were both interested in finding out. The brief 
to briefly add to our ideas, we might also add a, another dimension to our data, like a dimension of space or dimension of time. We might dig into time series data of images, just like, uh, namely a movie or a 3D image data set. Mm -hmm. That's great. No, I think that's, those are both really uh, great directions to go in. Briefly, before we transition, there's another question from, from Dennis um, about taking some of these techniques and applying them to other image types. Uh, particularly, you know, so you have, you know, mammograms, things a little bit where there's a lot more data as well. So, yeah, speaking of, if what we what would we would have liked to do if we had more time is to apply it to different data sets. Uh, we were actually even interested in applying it to like uh, natural image data sets because uh, most of the benchmark data sets involve natural images. Um, but one other data set that we have applied this to was uh, fluorescence microscopy data. And um, Annette was like the, the lead on that one. So I'll leave her to talk about it. Yeah, so we have a few very interesting findings about the uh, fluorescence data. So uh, as we mentioned, we used critics that learns the features of the images. So the different critics will, will learn different types of features within the, the images of biological structures. And when we apply this method to fluorescence data, we found that Overall, critics perform better than MNC, basic MNC loss. But then the way they uh, perform is a little bit different from on EM data. Like on EM data, the beam painting is the best when generating results for uh, super resolution. But on the fluorescence data, the um, self-critic generates the best result. So that's a very interesting um, direction to dig into. Great, thank you so much. All right, well, we're gonna move on to the next one, but any other questions, they can keep coming in. And if they're on the previous, um, the, the actual panelists will also start writing answers as well to the, um, to the Q&A directly. So next up is Zach Barnes, another great graduate student here in MSDS. And he's working on early prediction of hospital acquired sepsis. And this is in partnership with the, the UCSF Hospital Medicine uh, Group. We're really excited about this work here. So take it away. Hi, I'm Zach, a master's student at the University of San Francisco. For the past eight months, I've been collaborating with Leo Lil, professor at UCSF, and Andrew Saw, researcher at USF. Sepsis is when the body's response to an infection goes wrong and begins to injure its own tissues and organs. It is the most common cause of death in a hospital. The goal of early detection is to find cases of sepsis to assist in the clinical decision-making process. This is an ideal machine learning problem because it's impossible for physicians to look at all patient trends for all hours of the day in a hospital. The problem laid out in this presentation will highlight some of the novel additions we've made to sepsis early prediction research. Because patients are monitored more heavily in the ICU, it's rare for a physician to not identify a patient with sepsis. Instead, the regular hospital floor is where the real need for a sepsis monitoring algorithm is. That's why we're focusing on hospital-acquired sepsis as opposed to community-acquired sepsis. Using a data set with over 92,000 inpatient encounters, a prevalence rate for hospital-acquired sepsis is around 5%. We frame our problem as a multivariate time series classification problem. On the left, we have vital signs and lab values for a patient, and an onset time labeled with a black vertical line. On the right are the labels, with zeros up to the onset time of 105 hours and ones after. One of the areas that has been absent in previous research is feature engineering. For our models, we're looking at trend features like slope, drive features like shock index, as well as other observational data like level of consciousness. Perhaps the greatest challenge with EHR data is the large amount of missing values. Previous research has shown the effectiveness of Gaussian processes for this problem. Picture it as a patient's observed temperature denoted by the black points and a single Gaussian process approximation in red. To extend this to multiple features, we use a multitask Gaussian process. The advantage of using a multitask over a single task is that a multitask model can incorporate covariances between features. On the left, we have our raw features with missing values, and on the right, we have our features after the Gaussian process, where they are standardized and imputed. Now for our results. These results are from our validation set. We're using both area under the rock curve and area under the PR curve. These are overall metrics, which means that we're looking at every hour there was a prediction to be made. 
the rock curve, gradient boosting trees was the top model, while for the PR curve, the current neural network performed the best. What is arguably more important to assess is the performance before onset time. So we look at the rock curve and PR curve as a function of time. In this case, the gradient boosted trees models perform better close to onset time. For the PR curve, the RNN outperformed the tree-based models, but notice the random force is not far from the RNN. The value of 0.6 at four hours before onset time is state-of-the-art. Our AUC PR reaches around 0.67, setting a new state-of-the-art in addition to using the updated definition. Another area not focused on in previous research is feature importance. Using a random forest, we identified our engineered features, like 72-hour slope for heart rate, as being significant. To conclude, we want to stress that hospital-acquired sepsis is the more clinically important problem to address compared to community-acquired sepsis. Our current findings suggest that tree-based models with expert engineered features can rival state-of-the-art deep learning techniques. An advantage to using tree-based models is that it allows us to investigate future importances, providing insight for model tooting and explanations for predictions. We hope our framework points the way towards creating context-specific models in the healthcare space. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you so much. So we have a question right off the bat. Um, so the first question is from Animesh. Uh, so why did, Zach, why did you need to, you know, use, you know, engineer features versus just using a pure unsupervised model is the question. Yeah, um, can everybody hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah, the, the, the main reason is because um, like using anomaly detection sort of approaches to label a data is extremely hard because to label patients in the first place with the definition is, is um, like a really complicated procedure that involves looking at many time and uh, like lab values. So um, as far as we've seen, unsupervised approaches are, are not um, like, the, like a really good way at all to label the, the data. Mm -hmm. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Zach, as well for that work. Um, and I am getting the flag that we want to stay on time. So I'm going to introduce the very next group here. So good work, Zach. And if there's more questions, please just write them in the, into the Q&A box and, and Zach will be able to address them. Um, so next up is uh, Roja Im Imani, um, who has been working on uh, simpler CNN models for medical image classification. And this is in partnership with the Radiation Oncology, one of our Radiation Oncology groups at UCSF. So, Roja, take it away. Hey, everyone. I'm Roja. I'm a master's student at University of San Francisco. For the last eight months, I've been working with UCSF for my practicum project, along with my mentors, Janet, Andrew, and Gilmer. This project focuses on building simpler CNN models for medical image processing. Let me give you some context of the problem. So although there are millions of medical imaging procedures done every week worldwide, it is estimated that there is a shortage of over 4 million physicians. And this can lead to delays in the diagnosis and eventually lead to increase in the total number of deaths. This is where we see an opportunity to use deep learning to automate some of this interpretation processes and also speed up the process. We have seen a lot of work done in the past uh, that has groundbreaking results in detecting some abnormalities such as tumor detection and other internal disease detection. But this is the problem. Most of the popular deep learning models are designed for the natural image data sets. That is the natural objects that we see around us every day. And the natural images are fundamentally di quite different from the medical images. Here are a few key differences between them. With respect to size, medical data sets are very small in size. Uh, this is due to multiple limitations, uh, that is privacy and legal related issues. Not all the data related to a patient can be made publicly available. And also with respect to the nature of the image, natural image is generally in RGB scale versus a typical medical image is in grayscale. So this is the problem we present. 
is it necessary to use this over parameterized architecture that are designed for natural image data sets to be trained on simpler data sets like medical image medical images so this is what we had done to address this problem we started with three medical data sets so first one is mura bone xd and second one is brain ct scan this is used to detect if uh there is a hemorrhage or not in a brain ct scan and third is a check spur some of these uh, data sets are huge but then we downscale them uh, to make them look like a typical medical data set and then we have applied few techniques to downscale the model we start with two base architectures in this case resnet 18 and mobile net which has 11 million and 3.4 million parameters respectively and we use techniques like using different convolution blocks and width and depth down scaling to reduce the model size so to give you some idea on the techniques that we used for example we started with the resnet base resnet 18 base architecture which has 11 million parameters and as we replace the original convolution with a group convolution and eventually a depth wise convolution number of parameters in the model has reduced to almost 700k that means we are able to downsize it by over 15 times and uh, what i mean by width and depth down scaling is if this is the baseline model width scaling refers to increasing or decreasing number of channels at each layer and depth down scaling refers to adding or reducing the layers in the model here are the results from our experiments we uh, we used auc score to evaluate all our models and when we used grouped convolution instead of an original convolution that is in resnet 18 we noticed an improvement in the performance with mura and rsna although the model size has reduced by 15 times but there is a slight decline in the performance in chexpert and the next step we used uh, a combination of width and depth down scaling to further reduce the model size and in this case we first train these downscale models on the image net and finally fine tune them over the medical image data sets so although the model size reduced to 250k and 200k parameters there is a slight or almost no difference in the performance over across all the three medical data sets but there is a huge decline in the performance on the image net data set hence we would like to conclude that there is a opportunity to save on infrastructure costs and training time when we are using deep learning architectures to solve for medical image processing thanks to everyone who has been part of this project and feel free to reach out to me for any questions Thank you Roja. Uh that's been an exciting project to watch and you know it's one of these examples where you know a great deal of the the approach was actually in 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 experimenting and designing new architecture. Um so you know do do you have any senses to that that performance um you know you had two that were improved and one that wasn't do, do you know if there's any particular understanding as to why that in that one example Roja that it wasn't as effective? Um uh, can you repeat the question again? Sorry. So I think it was in the checks uh image set Oh oh uh, yeah uh, I I understand So the problem is slightly different with the checkspert and the and the other two data sets checkspert the problem is the multi label classification versus the other two are binary classification so um, my hunch is that it's different problems have different kinds of techniques that works for them so for checkspert although uh, depth and width down scaling work pretty well the group convolution idea didn't work pretty well so okay yeah no, that makes sense great um, there's all right so you know next thank you again uh roja and so next up uh we get to see uh our first natural language processing project uh of of the day so uh um, it's a pleasure to introduce max uh kelhoff who's a graduate student working in partnership 
with uh, Georgetown University um, and that group there on an NLP approach to medical report classification. So take it away. Hello, my name is Maxwell Kalehoff. Welcome to my presentation, an NLP approach to medical report classification. I was assisted in this endeavor by Issa Bakar, our faculty mentor, Andrew Shaw, and our research partner at MedStar Georgetown, Ross Felice. Medical students in residency analyze imaging scans such as MRI, CT, and ultrasound, and write reports proposing a diagnosis. Doctors write the final report and provide feedback to students. However, doctors are busy and would ideally only provide feedback when there is a problem with the student's report. Hospitals need a way to automatically identify student reports with discrepancies. <laughs> Our goal was to create this automated discrepancy identification process. We aim to use data from existing image reports to train a language model capable of understanding and identifying material differences between student and doctor reports. Using such a language model, we could train a classification model capable of determining if a discrepancy between the documents exists and how severe that discrepancy is. Seeing that the ultimate purpose of solving this problem was to provide better feedback to medical students, it would be helpful to visualize the relevant differences between the report pairs. The current method is called a diff tool, which merely finds raw text differences without any regard to the meaning of sentences. It treats insignificant and significant discrepancies between reports in the same way, which is not ideal for providing feedback. In this example, the student and attending both made significantly different observations on the same image. While in this example, a minor change in the attending's report caused the diff tool to find a difference between the sentences, even though there really wasn't any. While we had hundreds of thousands of image reports at our disposal, most of these were written only by doctors, and we had only about 10,000 usable report pairs. These pairs had an ID label, a label indicating what type of scan the report was about, and a grade which indicated the severity of the discrepancy between the report pairs. Fortunately, this was sufficient to create our language and classifier models. We also combined the labels corresponding to different degrees of disagreement into a single disagree category, as the model had trouble classifying the report pairs into four categories simultaneously. To create the language model, we combined the corresponding report pairs into a single text string with a delimiter between them. We then created an AWD LSTM language model on these combined reports, which we used as the pre-trained model for our classifier. After training for 23 epochs, we obtained an accuracy score of 0.75, which is quite good for a language model. Next, using our pre-trained language model, we trained an AWD LSTM classifier. As you can see, after training for 23 epochs with a triangular learning rate, we obtained an accuracy of 0.92. Using the classifier model, we were able to significantly improve our visualization capabilities. Certain parts of the document are highlighted in green colors. These are the words that the model has determined are most important to its decision. In this example, the model correctly identified the report pair as disagree. The visualization indicates that the term brachiocephalic led to a decision to disagree. As you can see, there is a meaningful difference between what the student and doctor said about the brachiocephalic fistula. In addition, the visualization indicates that the doctor made a comment about avascular collection that the student missed entirely. The model is also capable of distinguishing between report pairs with significant and insignificant differences. As you can see, the model has correctly identified this report pair, which has only minor phrasing differences, as agree. This methodology has other applications in addition to comparing imaging reports. It is particularly good at binary classification of other medical texts, such as pathology reports. For example, we can determine whether breast cancer pathology reports indicate a malignancy with 95% accuracy. Going forward, we intend to further improve this model by implementing stepwise classification so that we can determine the degree of discrepancy between report pairs. Thank you. All right, thanks, Max. Uh, very clear, very clear presentation. Um, so what were some of the challenges in getting this model um, up and running for a data set like this? Uh, yeah, well, I guess the, uh, the biggest challenge was because we were, we were comparing such large documents to each other. Um, and there, some, some of them followed a structural pattern because they reported, but some of them didn't. 
So you basically would have to compare like the very last word, uh, you could potentially compare the very last word of the doctor's report to the very first word of the student's report. And they'd be very far apart um, in terms of text because some of these are pretty long. So just being able, just tuning the, tuning the model to be able to, you know, uh, compare enti the entirety of two documents to one another uh, was probably the biggest challenge. Yeah, no, that does sound like a challenge. Um, and, and then sort of the follow up here is at, at that sort of level of accuracy, is that, you know, in a place where you think about developing that next medical tool um, around this, what are, what is the partners at, at Georgetown thinking with, with something like this? Yeah, so I guess this would, this would serve as an initial flag uh, to indicate if a student made a mistake. So you could automatically, would, it would automatically compare the two reports and say, hey, this one doesn't, uh, this one's not a, this one is a disagree. We should probably talk to the student about them and teach them. Uh, and also the student would, pro ideally the student will immediately be able to see um, that new um, uh, differentiation tool which highlights the parts that actually had a disagreement between them. So instead of just saying like, these are the raw text differences between the report and the student having to go back and say, oh, I guess that's kind of different, but it basically means the same thing. They can actually see, oh, okay. So these two, even though they were phrased differently, these things meant the same thing. And even if these two things were phrased similarly, but meant different things uh, that caused there to be a difference. So just improving feedback for students and improving the uh, teaching experience and, you know, Doctors are very busy, so any time we can save helps uh, improve quality of care. Thanks, Max, and I think we'll need something like that for MSDS next year. Um, so, you know, uh, I definitely want to. I'll, I'll keep this moving along. And again, thanks, Max. And if any questions that come in, you know, a lot of the the researchers that have spoken, they'll be able to answer them in, in the Q and A box directly. But next up is our postdoc here at the Data Institute. Uh, Issa Tahir Bahar, he's gonna give a talk on fast acquisition microscopy via deep learning. And this has been uh, in partnership with the in vivo microscopy group at Harvard. So Issa, I'm gonna let you take it away. Oh, you're on mute, Issa. Isa, you're, oh, can you hear? You're on, e oh, you have to go off mute. Oh, okay. sorry. Hey, I am time. Welcome to my presentation on fast acquisition microscopy via deep learning. Uh, this project has been done in collaboration with Harvard Medical School. And I have been assisted very heavily by Andrew So, David, and uh, Claudio, Dr. Claudio from Harvard University. Uh, a little about myself, I am currently postdoc at the Data Institute. In addition to this fast acquisition microscopy, I also work on radiology and pathology report classification project, project that uh, Mark presented earlier. Before joining the Institute, I completed my PhD in nonlinear analysis of partial differential equations at Auburn University here in the United States. I did my pre PhD in Italy, master's in Nigeria, undergrad in Senegal, and high school in China. So, um, fast acquisition microscopy is needed for biological structure in motion, but but this fast acquisition induces low resolution noise and uh, spatial distortion in the images. And to solve this problem, our approach is to go ahead and acquire images, microscopy images, fast at acquisition rate higher than video rate, and then use deep learning to correct for low resolution noise and distortion. We build a deep learning model that can simultaneously super resolve gene wise and correct for distortion. We need label data. And uh, for our case, uh, there are several techniques to acquire label data, but for our case, we use laser scanning microscopy. And a laser scanning can be either used in unidirectional mode or bidirectional mode. The unidirectional mode has less noise, while the bidirectional mode is faster, but it uses motion artifact and uh, 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 correct motion artifact, sorry, and it uses noises and uh, high spatial distortion. So we occur high resolution images 
uh, in unidirectional mode at half to one frame per second. And uh, they have no noise and they are not distorted. And this is an example. And the corresponding low resolution are acquired in bidirectional modes at 20 frames per second. This is like 20 to 40 times the acquisition of uh, resolution images. These are noisy and distorted. And then we build fast AI unit and gun models on 6,000 pair images of material control. And this is the typical example. This is the low resolution image. This is the corresponding grant root. And uh, this is the output of our model when we pass this low resolution image. So our results are as follows. The first is that our models are able to simultaneously correct for noise, super resolve, and correct for distortion. Here is an example. This is a low resolution image acquired at um, 20 frames per second, right? very fast, so it has noise and distortion. This is a corresponding ground truth. This in C is the reconstruction of this low resolution by our unit model. And uh, this uh, is the reconstruction of our gun model of this low resolution image. Next, because uh, it is difficult to gather large amount of paired images, we studied and see if we can reduce the number of paired images we train on without losing the model performance uh, much. And actually we were able to show that uh, we can reduce the number of paired images we train on by almost one fourth without losing much on the model performance. And then we compare across super resolution techniques. And we show that UNET and GAN perform excellent results in terms of SIM and PSLR. And finally, we check how these models generalize to unseen and unrelated biological structures. So remember, we trained the model on mitochondria, And here we check if these models can generalize onto histological slides. Actually, they do generalize very well after some point in. And here is an example. This is, the, this is a low resolution image. This is corresponding ground truth. And this is the, our gun prediction before fine tuning. This is gun prediction of this low resolution after fine tuning. This is unit prediction of this low resolution uh, before fine tuning, and this is after fine tuning. And they really do, uh, these models do, do a very great job in reconstructing this image. In conclusion, uh, bidirectional scanning combined with deep learning enable us to acquire images fast as acquisition rate higher than video rate without losing much in image quality. And also we can train deep learnings on optimal number of pair images. And we also show that our unit and gun, they generalize uh, very well on unseen and unrelated biological stuff. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Isa. And I'm gonna just shoot one quick question at you before we move on. Um, so, you know, given this, the level of uh, sort of, you know, sort of increase in accurate, uh, I would say in resolution uh, and sharpness, you know, what is it, what is a downstream task uh, will, that you think this could be helpful for, um, for, for the medical community? Oh, this can be like applied to moving objects. This we did only for images, but this can be like applied for medical images, like things we can moving 3D moving objects. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, yeah. Actually, we can uh, take it to um, deployment and uh, make this available so that people can apply and also fine tune. Great, great. All right, well, thank you, Isa. And moving right along with our uh, second to last presentation, I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Lexi Sun, who's gonna speak about brain EEG disease classification with LSTMs. And this is in partnership with brain, the Brain Labs at UCSF. Hi, everyone, I'm Lexi Sun, a master's student in data science at the University of San Francisco. For my practicum, I'm working with the neuroscientist Ashishi Raj and senior biomedical engineer Xi He Xie from the Brain Networks Lab at UCSF. Also, Jeanette is my mentor at USF. I'll be talking to you today about this project 
an LSTM architecture for multiple disease diagnosis and prognosis from brain image data. Talking about the motivation, as we all know, the correlations between structural connectivity and functional patterns of neural activity in the human brain is of fundamental interest in computational neuroscience. Our purpose is to develop an LSTM architecture to extract information from multiple channel brain MEG data. Magnetoencephalography, also MEG, is a functional neuroimaging technique which enables a non-inversive mapping of the brain activity. Similarly, the brain function manifested in neural oscillations can be measured non-inversively using MEG and reconstructed across whole brain networks. So based on this idea, we developed this architecture to analyze the MEG spectra, extract quantitative information, make predictions on the brain functional parameters of interest. So these results make it possible to characterize neurological diseases such as autism spectrum disorder, Alzheimer's disease, Huntington's disease, also to make early diagnosis and prognosis. Here, I'm going to talk a little bit more about data. The data is of 36 adult objects, which has about 32,000 spectral objects. Each spectrum has a shape of 86 by 40, which stands for 86 brain regions and 40 frequency bands. For a MEG spectrum, we want to find a bunch of parameters that could describe the spectrum. Here are the parameters we selected. Here is the model pipeline. As shown in the picture, our architecture is made up of several sequential parts, including stores, signal preprocessing, MCMC simulation, and LSTM modeling. So all the images were recorded at a sample frequency of 1200 Hz. The signal preprocessing includes downsampled signals from 1200 Hz to 600 Hz, then filtering noisy artifact outside a certain bandpass range. After that, we applied source localization. This divided the original signals into 68 cortical regions and 18 subcortical regions. Now we have the original dataset for training the models, which have a shape of 86 by 40. However, since we don't have much data, we apply Markov chain Moncaro method to simulate from the original dataset to get more samples for training. Then we pass the data to the LSTM RNA model and get the final results. Here I want to talk a little bit more about the neural network model, basically why we choose LSTM. So based on a moment-to-moment -moment perspective, our brain is collecting dynamic, multidimensional information and process and produce rich behaviors. So the most important thing here is the behavior are context dependent. This makes LSTM a perfect match for this problem. Here comes the results. For the patient ID, we have an accuracy of 0.16. As we can see in the plots, the model has a really good performance on structural connectome related parameters. The parameter tau e here has a R square of 0.71. It represents the delays in neural responses of excitatory neurons. Also the alpha, uh, which represents a global coupling constant that controls the relative weights given to a long range reference compared to the local signal. It has a R square score of 0.79. Also, the parameter speed, which describes the cortical cortical fiber conduction speed, has a R square score of 0.997. So, to improve the model performance, we are thinking about increasing the model complexity, also using bidirectional LSTM. Finally, we want to make this architecture a pre trained model with applications of like new data sets and characterizing more diseases. What I talked about today was how to use MEG data to make diagnosis and prognosis. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. And uh, thank you for that, that presentation as well. Uh, you know, the, the question I think that arose in my mind, you answered quite well, which is why LSTM. Um, 
Given that, though, did you try any sort of uh, competitors as well in terms of performance and, and follow up to that? Um, could you give a little context around that accuracy um, for, for the use of, of the model? Yeah, sure. So my work is like, can everyone hear me? Yep, yep. Yeah, okay, good. Uh, thanks for the question first. And my work is like most based on the previous work, like this awesome work of Ashish Raj, also like Bobby and uh, the previous students. Um, so they have tried a uh, convolutional neural network, which has a like, uh, the result was good, but like it's now like, it's kind of uh, only have good performance on two of the parameters, but like you, as you can see, we have like a pretty good results on three of the parameters. And then they didn't like include the patient ID, but we feel like that's pretty important when we apply them to like different patients. Also, like I would say um, the patient ID, the accuracy is pretty much the biggest challenge of this project because like we have tried a lot of methods to like make it good, but it's still like only like less than point two, which is now very good. So uh, we have tried to like, so we have 36 patients and we tried to leave one patient out for test. And then like the, the uh, other 65 patients for like training and validation. Mm -hmm. And the point two is pretty much on the test. So we are trying to like improve it, maybe like to increase the model complexity or doing something else, but we still like figuring that out. Yeah, no, thank you though. It's, it's still very impressive work and I could tell it was, it was a big challenge. Um, so, and almost ending on time, I'd like to introduce our last set of, uh, our last speaker. Um, and this is a group of Wending Hu and Ta Zhang. Uh, and they're gonna be speaking about uh, contrast enhancement prediction in brain MRI. And this is in partnership with the, with the group at Stanford as well. Um, so I'm gonna let them take it away to, to close out on the research side of things. Hi guys, I'm Todd. Me and my teammate Wendon is here to talk about our project, which is contrast enhancement prediction in brain MRI. For the past three months, we have been working with Professor Greg Zaharchuk, who is a professor of radiology at Stanford University, and Andrew Shaw, who is a researcher at University of San Francisco. Here is an image of MRI. And if I tell you that there is a tumor present in this image, it's pretty hard to tell where the tumor is. However, the task becomes much easier with this image because there is a white bright dot that is highly contrasted with the rest of the brain regions. And this contrast is achieved through the injection of gadolinium-based contrast agents. This is why that gadolinium-based contrast agents is widely used in MRI practices. However, the drawbacks of using it is that it could have harmful effects on human body. Therefore, in our research, we are trying to use deep learning algorithms to predict those contrast regions in the brain instead of relying on gadolinium-based contrast agents. And four different MRI modalities to predict the final output. Each MRI modality contains a unique set of information about the same brain. And to get to the final predicted contrast enhanced MRI, which is also called MBravo GD, the GD stands for gadolinium, we are adding an intermediate step in there. Our model first tried to predict the residual between the contrast enhanced MRI and the non-enhanced MRI. The reason that we are training on and predicting residual is because we would like to subtract out insignificant regions in the brain, such as the skull, and really focus and isolate on the tumor. And we're adding this residual to the original non-enhanced image to arrive at the final contrast-enhanced MRI. In this image, the contrasted area is the thin white line along the middle of the brain. We have about half a million slices of those non-enhanced images, and we have about 100 thousand slices of the enhanced images. This is Wendell. So the model that we selected is a basic unit. Totally, there are four downsampling layers and four upsampling layers. 
The metrics that we selected to evaluate the performance of our model are PSNR and SSIM. For both of the two metrics, the higher score that you get, the better performance your model is. Both of the two metrics mean hey everyone, that our I'm... model performs good. Let's look at a set of results. On the left corner, it is a predicted residual. We're clipping negative value to zero and get the clipped predicted residual. We add the clipped predicted residual with the true n bravo and get a predicted n bravo guide. We can compare the predicted n bravo guide with the true n bravo guide. We can see that the enhancement part was successfully predicted, and that is what we are looking for. Here are some brief conclusions for the technology that we use in this project. The image augmentation, like rotation, prevents our model from overfitting. The adjacent slices helps our model to learn the spatial attributes. The additional modalities enables our model to learn more detailed information, and the residual helps our model to focus on the contrast part. David, you're on mute. Thanks. I had to do it once, right? Okay. Um, so again, thank you so much for that presentation. We have a we have a, a question in the Q and A um, coming from one of actually our, our research partner at UCSF. Uh, the example you showed did not have any tumor. Are you training on healthy data only? Is the is the question um, for that team? Uh, no. Uh, the example just uh, just was used to uh, to help you to know why we have to uh, do this project, why we need to build a model to like predict the enhancement part. Yeah, there are some uh, tumor example, but we didn't choose that. Yeah. Yep, very good. Um, and so, you know, another follow up here uh, is, you know, it actually looks like a, a very significant amount of um, accuracy already on the detection piece. Um, do you see, you know, the, what, what are some of the downstream um, possibilities for, for a model like this for, you know, for the health community? That's downstream. Uh, what do you mean by that? So, you know, so given, you know, given that this is, has some really nice detection, um, you know, what are sort of the next steps with something that has a sort of level of accuracy, at least for, you know, on the, on the medical side? Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, uh, you mean uh, how to improve our results further? Uh, no, more like how could it be used now that given that it, I know there's probably good ways to make it even better, but you know, how can it be used next? Right. I think uh, we can maybe transfer this model uh, to other imaging techniques that rely on contrast based agents. Yep. So yeah, so right now we're trying to eliminate gadolinium based contrast agent in brain MRI uh, particularly, but maybe there's others that, uh, types of imaging techniques that will rely on contrast-based agents, and we can maybe transfer this model into other applications like that. Very nice, very nice. Well, thank you both again. And Andrew, I think that brings us to the end here, and I think we just have a final slide or two, but I just wanted to start by saying uh, thank you to everyone who was able to attend, uh, and, and, and thank you for all the participants that stayed, which appears to be through almost the entire presentation. Um, I really, really want to say thank you to Dan Tierney and the Wicklow Foundation and Fred Monroe for all their support. Um, and this really could not be done with all of the medical research partners that we've uh, built relationships with over years and are brand new. Um, and, you know, we hope that, you know, this experience with our graduate students and our postdocs um, have, has been fruitful and, and, and a meaningful partnership uh, for you all. And then of, that, of course, you know, leaves me to say just one last thing, which is our call for collaboration next year. Um, you know, last year we, we put out a call for, for new partnerships and we're really, um, really, you know, in a really positive way, overwhelmed with the response. And um, as a result of such a response, we were able to just give just today a subsample of the projects that were done all year. Um, and, you know, what that means for us is we'd like to put that call out again. Um, so if you, if you, if you're interested in what you heard about today, if you want to explore more, if you would like to come in contact with a lot of the research that are doing this stuff, um, feel free to reach out to them directly. And this contact email below is, is a great way to reach out around how, you know, maybe USF and the Data Institute through WAMRI can uh, partner with, uh, you know, new teams and returning teams again next year.
So with that, thank you again, uh, students. Thank you, Andrew, and thank you, Jeremy, as well, for um, having a great year of work. And you know, I know with a month left, there's a lot of paper writing to be done and, and models to continue to be tuned. So with that, I'm gonna I'm gonna sign off and say uh, thank you, everyone, for coming. <laughs>